The next check we added was checking if you're accidentally about to push a whole bunch more stuff than you actually thought you were going to, like so. What I actually asked Spark to do was promote PHP not point one point, sorry, promote the PHP cookbook. I went through my process, I bumped it, I uploaded it, I changed the version constraint. What I forgot was earlier on, I was fiddling about with the environment and I accidentally changed a bunch of other constraints. Again, out of the box, nothing will stop you uploading that file. It will revert your cookbook to previous versions. Might not even break and you, you probably won't notice for ages. So what we did was we added a check which diffs your local environment with the environment on the server and tells you if you're about to change a whole bunch of other cookbooks. We've actually, what we've found is the most common cause of this is when someone's testing something and they've uploaded a constraint which isn't committed to Git yet. So we're then about to, when we push the environment, we're then about to revert the remote commit to what we have in, in Git, which is usually less. So we're kind of undoing the person's change. So this will pick it up that way around as well. Whether you've changed something locally that isn't remote yet, or you've changed, or someone else has changed something remotely that isn't in your local repository, it will stop you from trampling on that change. Well, you can if you want, it will give you the option. Are you sure you want to continue? If you say no, you're done. It will reset your local environment to match what's on the server if you want. Or if you're sure you really want to do it, you can continue. But it just avoids that potential screw up which, we, again, we all found ourselves doing multiple times. That's why we added the check. A lot of the other stuff we added was, um, as, as we used Spork and we got more accustomed to it and stuff, we kept thinking of, of new shiny things we wished it could do. And since we had the tool ourselves, we were able to add them without you know, having to wait for a new chef release or whatever. One of the first things we added was default environments. Now, this doesn't mean the underscore default environment, which is what you'll get if, uh, if you... If your node isn't specifically put in an environment, it ends up in underscore default. What this meant was we found ourselves repeatedly running the same commands on both environments. We have, in the main, two environments, production and development. Every time we made a change, we were having to promote to production, then promote remote to production, then promote to development. It's a pain, and you forget stuff, and it's just generally annoying. So we just added behavior in to let you specify your default environments, the ones you work with all the time, then if you don't specify which one you want to use, it will promote to both. It's fairly simple. Next, we added Git support, uh, because that's what we use internally. Uh, you end up doing a whole load of stuff with every change, like every time you change metadata.rb on your environment files, you then have to get add them as well as what you've changed. It's annoying, it's repetitive, so we programmed, programmed it out of the way. We made, we made Spark automatically git add the file it changes. It'll tell you it's done it. It's not going to, you know, commit a whole bunch of stuff you didn't know about. We added chat notifications. Um, this is, this isn't the same as what I showed you before when we have notifications of fails. This was avoiding the fact that we didn't know when someone else was working on a cookbook, especially when you have that number of people working on it. You can both be working on one of the most common cookbooks, for example, Apache or PHP, three people could be working on it at the same time. They're all changing it, they're all bumping it, and they're all fiddling with environment constraints. What we wanted to do was basically give ourselves some insight into what people were doing without having to run around 40 people trying to check what they were changing. So initially, we added support for IRC cat, which is the bot I mentioned we use internally, and the guys at Second Market have also added support for HipChat as well, if anyone uses that. So this is what we get. Um, we can see in our notifications channel. Patrick McDonnell uploaded and froze cookbook, ver cookbook in mount version 0.0.24 and he promoted it. We've also got a gist of what the environment he promoted to now looks like, or rather it gives you the change. It's again, it's a fairly simple thing. It's not, it's not particularly technically complex to do this, but it just gives us that little bit more insight into what Chef's doing. One of the most useful things we've added, which kind of was almost a, at one point an afterthought, we thought, hey, it would be really cool if we could do this, and then we discovered how useful it was. This is the exceptions and, or basically the exceptions graph that our Apache servers are throwing. The black line that you see across the graph is what we call a deploy line, but it's basically a graphite metric. Um, that represents somebody having done promote dash dash remote. So we have all of, our, all of our wonderful graphs, probably most of the rest of you do as well. What this now shows us is the instant somebody changed something on Chef. If I can see a massive cliff-like spike in this graph after that line, that's a fairly good indication 
although not guaranteed, correla correlation doesn't imply causation, it's a fairly good indication that my chef change did something bad. It's just another way of you finding out what you've done wrong. We all do it, we're all human. Most recent thing we added, which I touched on before, was integrating with Food Critic. Now, this ties back into the standards section. This is us making sure that when we've decided on a best practice, you can't get around it. What we don't want to happen is to have documented procedures and change request forms that have to go through a QA department and be approved, like would happen in you know, Megacorp X or whatever. We want to leave the control in people's hands. You know, we're all clever people. We, want to, we don't want to be hamstrung by you know, procedures and change control documents that are 10 pages thick. It's just not necessary. We have, you know, we have the power. We can tool this stuff ourselves. So we slightly modified our Spark uploader to do a lint check before it uploads. It simply runs Food Critic with our inbuilt rules, uh, which are open sourced, as I mentioned. Then it tells you if you've broken any of them. In this case, I broke the execute resource was used to run a curl or wget command. So instead of using remote file, I just stuck a wget command in there, um, which, by the by, we decided was bad because it quite, it's quite bad at telling you what the actual error in the command was. It will give you the exit code, but you can lose a lot of information. Then you have to go digging and try and run the command again. And it's now stopped me from uploading this cookbook. So I've instantly stopped myself from screwing something up that screwed us over before. This could have been a package upgrade. This could have been I copy and pasted some old... I, I looked at the last way we did a memcached upgrade. I copied it, and there was accidentally an action, action upgrade in there. So rather than having control of my upgrade, I've just gone and upgraded memcached on 100 servers. We, learned, we made that mistake already. It woke several of us up. We don't want to have to do it again. Nobody likes getting woken up, pardon me, woken up at 4 a.m. So we built, tool, we built the tool to stop us doing it. Like I said, under the hood, this is all basically environments. This is just the standard environments workflow. Out of the box, the way it comes from Chef, we haven't added any new behavior that will break compatibility next time Opscode do a release. What we have done is we've just added a wrap around it to make it work for us. Our, our situation isn't the same as your situation. You might be the only person in your organization touching Chef. But again, what I want to do in this talk is give you some ideas of what you can do and ma make you realize the potential that Chef has to work for you. It is a generic product, but you can make it do anything you want, pretty much. That's kind of the non-coding part of the, of the talk. What I want to go on to do now is kind of give you a little bit more useful or rather specific information on how you can actually do some of this stuff. It's all very well hearing someone talking at a conference on, hey, we developed this tool, and hey, we developed this handler. Isn't this awesome? You can download it here. But it's not much use if you don't use the same systems as us. If you don't use Graphite and IRC Cat, all of those slides are essentially meaningless to you. It's a cool idea, but you can't use it. So what I'm going to do now is one of the cardinal things you should never do in a presentation, and I'm going to do some live coding. <laughs> So we're going, to, we're going to look at two things. I'm going to look at how to work with the Chef API, just some simple examples of how to work with it. It's going to take the form of just generating an email report. This is something we've actually started doing quite a lot with Chef. Um, as I mentioned, we use an unconstrained testing environment, which we, you know, if we want to test something, we move a node into the testing environment. It's unconstrained, so it picks up the latest version of the cookbook. Once we're happy, we go through the normal workflow, promote the constraint, move the node back. But you can forget, you can leave a node in the testing environment and it's still picking up the latest cookbook all the time. And if it's not the server you're expecting to test on, you've, you might have just broken something. So we have a daily report that checks what nodes are in the testing environment and sends us an email just to say, kind of, hey, did you mean to leave this in here? Little stuff like that. I'm also going to demonstrate probably something of slightly, sl slightly more widespread use, which is how to write a knife plugin. Now... I wrote my first knife plugin shortly after I started at Etsy. I'd never written one before, and I thought the same thing that most of you are probably thinking now, which is writing plugins isn't very easy. That's not the case, which we'll go on to see shortly. So hopefully this is gonna, is gonna work when I turn on display mirroring. Excellent. Okay, so 
that's the URL where you can get the GitHub repo that's got the code templates I'm about to go through. It's exactly the same as what I'm, got, what I'm going to be working off if anyone wants to download them, if you can coax the Wi-Fi into life. I, I'm wired. Um, if everyone hits this URL at once, none of you are going to get it. <laughs> the conference Wi-Fi has been a little bit slow today. But if you want it, it's there. It's the same code templates and stuff. So what I'm going to start off is absolutely minimal example of how to interface with a Chef API. Um, anyone not from Ops Code or who hasn't heard me talk about this before care to venture a guess at what the minimum number of codes, in, number of lines of code, including the shebang line and any necessary requires, is to query the Chef API and actually return some kind of meaningful result. Any numbers from the floor? Sorry? Two. Slightly more. It's actually six. Six lines of code will get you working with the Chef API. Uh, hopefully this font size... Is anyone at the back having trouble reading that? Is that okay? It's the best one. Sorry? It's the best one so far. Excellent. Glad to hear it. Um, so this is, this is done in Ruby, uh, partly because Chef's written in Ruby, more accurately because Ruby is the programming language I know best. So, and it's my talk, so you're getting it in Ruby. St standard shebang line, we're requiring Chef. This just needs you to have the Chef gem installed. Um, if you try and do this without using the Chef gem, if you try and use this, I mean, it's essentially a REST API. If you've worked with one before, you'll probably be fairly familiar with how they work. Um, doing this without the Chef gem is a lot harder because you have to authenticate properly to Chef with various keys and stuff. And I'd really recommend you don't. You can if you want. So the next line is setting up a config object. Because we're using the chef, um, the chef object, what we can do is this is, this is loading our knife config. Um, we're, all we're doing is loading my knife.rb. This generates a config object we can use, which gives us basically all of the parameters in the file. It gives us our chef server URL, our validation key, our client key, our cookbook paths, all that sort of stuff. It's giving you the information in that file in a, in a chef-friendly way so you don't have to parse it all yourself. What we're doing next, we're creating a REST object. Um, this is using the built-in chef REST object. We're creating a new one from the chef server URL key of the chef config object that we just created. Uh, I actually could have done that by putting config object in there. What we're doing here, we're actually doing, an, we're actually doing a search query. It's, it's the kind of simplest example I could think of that was actually going to be fairly useful to people. So this is, this is doing the same thing as knife search. I'm giving a search query to the chef server and you know, doing something with the results. So we have search results. We're calling the get rest method of our rest object and we're passing it the URL parameter. So it's slash search slash node. Uh, we're searching in the node context. This would be the same as doing knife search node. Likewise, if we wanted to do knife search role or whatever, we'd replace slash node with slash role. We're then giving the query string, which is exactly the same as the search query that you would give on the command line, chef environment, colon, libmem, cached upgrade. And we're then doing a put on the result. So what I'm going to do is just prove to you this actually works. No such file to load chef. Didn't expect it to do that. <laughs> oh, why are you doing this to me? It shouldn't need Ruby gems required, I don't think. I swear this worked when I tried it before. This is why you shouldn't do live coding and presentations, because stuff like this happens. Obviously, it worked when I tried it before. There we go. Thank you whoever said that from the back. <laughs> I didn't need to do that before, but I do now. So what we've got here, it, it's, it's essentially, this is a string, uh, it's essentially just got the JSON back. The REST API returns JSON for everything. All this has just done is converted it to a string, which isn't terribly useful. So what we can now do, I mean, th this is just basically giving a search query and getting the, getting the result back. What we can now do, you can't, you can't really see it, but what we actually have here is we have a list of all of the nodes in the testing environment. We can see there are four of them. 
I'm going to pick on um, my VM here to use for these examples. So what we can now do is we can say, right, actually I want to put search results. Dot, that's actually that's actually not what I wanted to do. I want to do dot first. So it's just getting the first, this is an array, so it's getting the first element of it. So now we've got rows, and we've got all of our all of our um, all of our nodes there, so it's giving us in a slightly more friendly format. We can then get dot first again of that, which will give us the first how things work totally differently when you're doing them in talks. So what I'm going to do is cunningly skip to my slightly expanded example, which isn't going to avoid me having to remember exactly how I did this before. Um, this is a slightly longer version of the same thing you just saw. I'm going to add require Ruby gems at the top because evidently I need to use it today. There's a whole bunch of other requires here. We're requiring several other gems, which I'll, I'll run through. Um, this gives you a bit more, a little bit more kind of idea of the kind of stuff you can do when you've been talking to the API. This section here is a gem called choice. It's just an easy way of handling command line options and scripts. It avoids you having to worry about uh, naming your arguments and stuff like that. So we've created our knife config object that we had before. Um, in this case, from the knife conf parameter, we passed to choices. Um, this, this is an email report, so we're setting up our email recipients. Same as we did before, we're loading our knife config file. We're creating our rest object, same as we did before. What we're doing now is we're running a query against the rest interface. This, this might seem like, if you don't know Ruby, slightly confusing code. If you don't, again, if you don't know Ruby, you're kind of going to have to take my word for it. This is, this is a slightly more friendly formatted version of the code, the six lines I showed you. It's doing, oh no, I've just realized why it didn't work, because I actually should have got the rules element. So what this is doing is running a REST query, same as it did before. I've added the addition of I'm actually um, using the uri.escape method of the URI object. All this is doing is URI formatting, so if I have special characters and spaces and stuff, it won't work. As I showed you up at the top, we've parameterized the query we're using here, life environment testing or life, chef environment lib memcached upgrade. Because we have spaces in this, if we pass it to the REST API without replacing it with percent %20, for example, it's going to break stuff. Uh, so URI escapes just a simple way of getting around that problem. We're iterating over the search results that we got back. If I actually jump back to this one and do and get rules. This, this will actually show you what I was trying to make it do before, where we get our list of nodes back. Uh, so what we can then do is what I was trying to do before, just basically grab the first element out of that array. So we'll jump slightly back to, the, to this one. Now the string representation list doesn't look very interesting. It's basically node brackets and the name of the particular node. What's cool about if using the Chef API interface to do this, as in using the Chef gem instead of talking to it yourself and parsing the JSON, is what we've actually got back there is a node object that we can actually do stuff with. Um, it's, it's not just a string. It's actually a fully fledged node object that we can get attributes from, we can change stuff on, uh, like when you do knife node show, for example. So if I jump back to the code and I do dot fqdn, so a fully qualified domain name, that should give me the FQDN attribute of that node. Um, I can then do dot to JSON. What that's essentially doing is it's taking the node, ob node object and printing out the JSON representation. This is, this is what you get with knife node show if you use the dash F JSON option. It will give you exactly the same output. So you can see all of the zillions of attributes we have here. 
We can get any of these. We can get, for example, the node run list, if we want to play around with that. If you want to generate a report on nodes that have particular things in their run list. So I keep bumping this microphone. It's that simple. We've now got, we've got role VM base and recipe home doors. Same as with the node. These are objects that you can manipulate in Chef. These aren't just a string saying role VM base. That's actually a role object, which you can edit. You can get attributes from the role even. If I do run list dot first dot name, so that this is this is essentially calling role VM base and saying give me your name attribute. It works. So what we've got there is six lines of code where we're talking to the API, we're getting back the results, we're grabbing a node out of the results, that's actually a chef node object, we're getting attributes from it. I realize I've jumped, jumped about slightly here, partly because this worked much better when I practiced it before. So going back to the more expanded version, that, that's what we've done here. Essentially, we've got our results um, and we've iterated over them. I've added a couple of special cases here. Sometimes knife searches, I'm not entirely sure why. They might return a nil result. Or you might end up with a node which hasn't got an FQDN attribute. For example, if it's added to Chef but it hasn't finished its first run yet, it might not have saved all its attributes. So we're filtering out those two cases and then we're collecting all of the FQDNs and adding them to a results array. This section is essentially it's just formatting an HTML email message. You can see in a couple of places we're adding a little comment saying results.size node match the query, basically just to tell you how many nodes you've actually got back. This is printing out the results. Uh, if you don't know Ruby syntax, essentially what map does is it's running, it's running this part of the expression on every element of the array, so it's just inserting TR and TD tags on either side of the actual value, and it's then joining all of that together with a new line, so it's not an array, it's just a string containing lots of new lines, and we're then just sending it using local SMTP. Now what I'm actually going to attempt to do is I'm going to try and get that to work as well. So if I run this by default, uh, we don't have, I don't know why this is doing this now. I don't think it's picked up my, uh, hasn't picked up my RVM, that's what it is. Rather than bore you all to death while I try and figure that out, um, it's essentially, I have a local Postfix server and it's sending the report. Um, it's literally a table that contains all the results of the query. Um, but this is, this is the minimal. That amount of code will let you work with the Chef API. If you look at the API reference on the ops code site, I've, I've used a search query. You can, for example, just grab a node directly. You can call a URL and you'll get back a node object you can do anything you want with. Which isn't so much, isn't so much likely to be used for reports. You're more likely to do a chef, um, a search query. Where it comes more useful is writing knife plugins. Specifically because knife plugins are where you're likely to do a lot more of the work. What we do, for example, with Spark when we do uh, promote is we're using the inbuilt chef objects to load our environment file. We're manipulating the constraints using built-in methods. This isn't code I had to write by myself. It's all there in the chef code base. So absolute minimal knife plugin is that. Four lines of code will get you a knife plugin that you can call in knife. It won't produce any output, but it won't throw any errors. What I've actually done is I've this isn't going to pick up RVM either, is it? What I'm going to do is I'm just going to... I tried to tidy up my bash profile this morning to stop it doing... to stop it doing uh, funny prompts and things so you'd all be able to see stuff and it's just ended up breaking a whole lot of things. So I'm just going to comment out a couple of lines that I managed to break in here. I think I've just figured out what I did to make it break. I just commented out the line that loads RVM. Mm -hmm. 
There we go. Now we're talking. So the code I just showed you there, essentially uh, what I've done here is I've got a class foo, which extends chef knife. You have to define a run method. This is, this is the entry point that knife uses to get into your code. It does nothing, it just exits. How, this, how you actually get this to work with knife as is, is you have to put the code into your, in your home directory. It goes in dot chef plugins knife. You can see here I've actually, I've actually symlinked knife plugin template in there. Um, that's, all it, that's all it takes to get your plugin to work. So if I then change this plugin to do puts hello velocity. So that, that works as well. This, the more useful part of this is when you want to do stuff like uh, so those objects I mentioned before you can get from the API, when you actually want to manipulate them and do things like, for example, change a node's run list, what I'm actually going to do, because um, we're actually running slightly lower on time than I thought, what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to talk you through the plugin that we use internally to change the environment of nodes uh, from production to testing. I wrote a simple plugin called knife node flip, where you just do knife node flip, name of node, environment you want it to go to, and it changes the environment parameter. It's very, very simple. Uh, that will give you a fairly good, fairly good idea of what I was talking about, about working with node objects. Um, I've added the extra line module knife flip, just so it's all, all, I keep all my plugins in the, uh, this, that's more to do with making it a Ruby gem and keeping it all nice namespace wise, that's actually not essential. What we have here is a bunch of other requires. Now the cool thing about Chef is rather than adding all of your requires at the top like you usually would in Ruby, uh, we have this depths block. What the, this is kind of a fuzzy dependency loader. What this basically does is it makes sure you only load the dependencies when you actually run the plugin that uses them, rather than loading them right at the start. Um, it basically just makes things a bit more efficient. Banner is another built, another chef built in. That essentially is what if you run the command without any environments or anything. Well, sorry, without any parameters. That, that's just the text it will give you. It's kind of the usage line that you would normally see in Bash. So if I do uh, knife node flip with no parameters, error you need to, I've, got, I've gone overridden my own logic. Oh, actually, sorry, I was slightly misspoke there. This is the text you'll get in knife. Uh, if we go slightly up here. So this is, this is the plugin we added before. See here we've got foo commands. This is what happens if you miss out the banner line. It, um, it gives you kind of a, a built-in line that's a little bit ugly. If you want to override that, so see we have knife environment show, for example, gives you a slightly more friendly option. Uh, what we've got down here is knife node flip. So this is that banner line. It's just a friendly, friendly kind of usage line to print in knife. So we've got our run method. I'm checking my parameters. Uh, you need to specify a node. You need to specify an environment. Just printing out a little, a little log of what's going on. This is the way you do a search query inside Knife. You don't need to interf interface with the ref REST API because you're already in Chef. Um, so here we actually have a query object that we can use, which is much easier. So we're creating the query object, and we're then calling the search method on it with our parameter, which will seem familiar to everyone as the exact format of the parameters used with Knife node search. We're searching in the node, I don't know, namespace or context, whatever you want to call it and we're giving it our search query. That line's actually redundant. So we're grabbing the first result of the first, the first element of the first element of the results array. We're checking if it's nil. If it's nil, it means we basically haven't found anything. Um, if, if that result is nil, we're just saying we can't find a node with the FQDN you asked for, so there's no point in going any further. We can't change attributes on a node that doesn't exist. This part is checking that the environment exists. What this uses is a built-in chef object called the object loader. Actually, no, sorry, this bit doesn't. That's further on. This is just loading an environment from the server. Chef environment load. And this parameter is the name of the environment which we passed into the command line. Because uh, under the hood, it's still using the API. We're trapping a 404 exception, which is the error, mes the error message it will return if you try and load an environment that doesn't exist because we want to give it a slightly nicer error message. Um, UI.error here is, 
what they do, what Knife has is a built-in, it's kind of almost a presentation object. It basically makes sure that everything interacts with the terminal in a consistent way, uh, in this context at least. So what that does is it generates an error level message. So just to demonstrate what that would look like, if I did a knife node flip, and I say, for example, pick my VM, and I try and move it into an environment called fish, it will find my server, but it's then saying the environment doesn't exist in the server. And see, it's showing us as an error level warning. Uh, Adds, an ent add, adds the exception to the de debug log. So if you're running Chef in debugging mode, it will give you the much more detailed exception. Now here's the part where we're actually writing back to Chef. Uh, search queries are all well and good, but sometimes you actually want to change stuff on the object that you're actually accessing. We're changing the node. So this is where I was talking before about you've got your node attributes, so your node object, and you can access, for example, the Chef environment attribute, which is literally just saying, tell me your environment, it then prints it out. The way Ruby works is most of these attributes have um, a set, a kind of a set method as well, so you can, you can write them as well as read them. What we're doing here is we're just saying the Chef environment parameter of the node is equal, is now equal to the environment parameter we passed in, and we're calling node.save. That's essentially saying, it's like when you do knife node edit and you've changed the metadata attribute and you then quit your text editor, it saves the node. This is doing that programmatically. Uh, and what we're then doing here is we're doing a knife search on the same node as we just had. Essentially all this is doing is proving that it actually did what it was supposed to do. So what this looks like if you run it with valid parameters, if I change this back to the development environment, for example, it looks for the FQDN and it then sets my node environment and it then prints out the results of knife node search. This is exactly the same as if I searched for the node manually. Um, I have to apologize slightly for this, not, this part of the talk not being quite as flawless as I envisaged it being in my head. Look at this as an example of why you shouldn't do live coding in talks. Um, I'm, hoping that, I'm hoping if any of you actually managed to follow me jumping around wildly, this has given you just, it's made writing plugins and interfacing with Chef seem a little bit less scary. Don't look at the plugin I just showed you. Look at that. That's a, that's a functioning knife plugin. It's not a very useful knife plugin, but it's a functioning knife plugin that doesn't show you any errors. If you want to go off and write a knife plugin that, I don't know, change, for example, changes the. Let's think of, well, to look at the example of Spork, um, if you want to write a plugin that goes off and checks all of your versioning constraints everywhere, it's actually not as difficult to do as you'd think. Uh, just because we've got five minutes left, I'll show you quickly what that looks like in Spork. Find the right directory. There's Spork. So this is our little um, our little plugin for checking versioning constraints. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff here to do with loading configuration from a configuration file, which you can ignore. It's not actual, it's not terribly useful to this part of the talk. Same as before, we have our definition, we have our fuzzy loader and our banner, which load all our dependencies. We're handling all our command line options. I'm saying quit if you're not using Ruby 1.9, because it does strange things. Bunch of file validation. Here's the actual part. First of all, we're checking if we have declared a valid cookbook path in our config, because otherwise we can't check a cookbook if we don't know where to find it. We're then double checking a couple of parameters again, printing an error message if we've missed parameters. Here's the slightly more useful version. This is get local cookbook version. There's two stages. First we get the local cookbook version, then we get all of the remote versions. All this one is doing is, is loading the file metadata.rb and parsing out the version number. That's not quite so exciting. It's parsing a text file. Getting the remote versions is again, now this one's actually been written against the REST API, so like I showed you in the report example. Um, you, can do, you could do this in two ways. You can do it using the built-in objects like I showed you before, or in, in my opinion, because as everyone knows, uh, for example, the back end of Chef's being written in Erlang and MySQL. I didn't want to assume nothing was going to change, so I wrote it against the API to try and make sure that if it did, it wasn't going to screw us over. So all we're doing here is we're calling the environments 
route. Remember, before we were using the search route, this is just loading an environment directly the same way as we got the search results from that one. And we are grabbing the cookbooks. Cookbooks is the result of the, of the API request. It's essentially a list of all the cookbooks in this environment, environment slash environment name slash cookbooks slash cookbook name will give you a JSON of all of the versions of a cookbook in a particular in, in a particular environment. So we're just extracting out that parameter from the JSON. And we're then doing a bit of pretty printing stuff. Although I haven't explained this very well, I hope I haven't scared anybody off thinking that writing code that works with Chef isn't actually that difficult. It's only difficult if you change your bash profile and remove all of your RVM settings that make your gems work. That is decidedly not helpful. But just think back to this. I've put these code, these code templates, uh, tiny.cc slash velocity2012, if anyone wants to play around with them. I've put the code templates up there. Um, you can go and develop against them yourself. If you, want to, if you want to talk about any of this under slightly less pressurized circumstances, um, I'm here myself. We've got some guys sitting over there and over here if you want to come talk to us. Obligatory hiring slide. We are very actively hiring at the moment. We're going to be doing a birds of the feather tomorrow um, with all the, in the, all the other birds of the feather areas. Come and say hi to us. Um, if you're interested in working with us, come and talk to us. If you're interested in a little bit more about how to write plugins and stuff, I'm happy to sit down and show you the version of what I'd imagined that section of the talk was going to go like when everything worked. Um, also, please learn from, this, from my lesson, don't do live coding in talks. That's pretty much all the stuff I have to go over. I hope it's been, been useful to people and given you some ideas for how to kind of adapt Chef to your own workflow and how to get a bit more familiarity and understanding out of it. Um, does anyone have any questions? At this point. No. Shoot. Uh, I was wondering how many different do you have? Do you have one for each product? Do you have one for all of We have one for everything. We, yeah, we have all of our, all, because everybody, everybody works with it, we have sort of 40 odd people. We just have the one repo. Um, we, sorry? What was the question? Uh, sorry, oh, for the question for people who didn't hear was do we have uh, one Git repo for every cookbook or do we have one repo for everything? Um, we did run into the issue of having there are some things that we don't want in the main repo. For example, we don't want all of our developers to have the private SSH keys, for example. So what we did there was we've separated some sensitive cookbooks into Git submodules that are a bit more locked down, but it's essentially just one repo that has all the roles, environments, and cookbooks for everybody in there. Anyone else? No questions. Excellent. Yep. Mm -hmm. so, so the question there was how we manage cookbook version numbers and how we manage it when you're, for example, uh, developing a cookbook and you just want to iterate over a whole bunch of changes. Basically, every time you change a cookbook, you change the version number. It's up to the individual to decide whether it's a minor, major, patch level release or whatever. We, we don't really care about that, just the number changes. Um, Iteratively wise, so we, we tend to manage that with our use of the testing environment, which isn't constrained at all. So like I was saying, we'll flip a node into the testing environment and then you know, make a whole bunch of changes. Technically speaking, you don't have to change the version number at that point. You can bump it once and then just you know, force upload a whole bunch of times. Personally, I tend to change the patch release number every single time, just so it's a bit more obvious what I've changed. Um, and then you set the constraint once you're ready for everything else to get it and put stuff back into production. Anyone else? Well, thanks for bearing with me for the um, slightly less than perfect code demonstration. Like I said, I'm happy to talk people through it a little bit more if they haven't totally lost faith in my ability to program. <laughs> thanks. <laughs>